from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all. Welcome once again to another episode of The Sculptor's Funeral, the figurative sculpture podcast. I'm your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and educator living in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead. And I don't feel so well myself. And today, we're going to listen to an interview with the American sculptor Brian Booth Craig. Now, last summer, when taking a break from some summer workshops Brian teaches in Rome, I invited him in to my studio for an interview, and I remember that day very well. The room where I record my podcasts is pretty small, and the heat that day was sweltering. When the interview started, I was hoping that we both could stand it long enough for a decent interview, maybe 45 minutes, and we ended up talking nonstop for three and a half hours. But even though the conversation was as engaging as it was long, don't worry, you're only going to get parts of it today. The topics we covered were far-ranging, and I imagine that this is not the last time you will hear Brian Booth Craig's voice on the podcast. Now, many of you are undoubtedly familiar with Brian Booth Craig's work if you hang out at the sculpture groups on Facebook or on Pinterest. His single-figure bronze nudes are not your sort of typical gallery, you know, nude female as eye candy. Rather, they're quite the opposite. They convey an inner power and strength. And almost as notable is his impeccable craftsmanship in his bronze pieces, over which he has complete hands-on control. Like most sculptors I know, doing work that stands out for its originality, Brian's education in the arts took a unique path as well. And in this interview, we trace that path. And in addition to being able to see some of his work on the image gallery at thesculptorsfuneral.com, Brian has a solo exhibition opening in New York this week. On April 7th, 2016, at the Bernarducci Mizell Gallery in 57th Street, Brian Booth Craig's exhibition, titled Internal Variations, Figures and Gestures, will open and run for the rest of April, showing 13 new works. In a preview of the exhibition in American Art Collector magazine, Brian Booth Craig explains how his new work explores the relationship between artist and model. I wanted to explore the psychological interaction with another human being in the studio, he says. The female figure was the natural choice, because I would be less likely to project notions of myself onto the other. The role of the model is shifting into a more collaborative one. I find the relationship a deep source of artistic exploration. Well, I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. I always like to hear, and I think a lot of people like to hear about how an artist, you know, gets their start, because everyone starts in a different way. No one arrives... That success through you know sort of a yeah. system yeah. but you started out at Penn State right Correct. in a conceptual sort of thing Correct. so what got you into that in the first place yeah they I did go to a uh, an art program that was not figure based at all in fact there wasn't a single figure sculpture class or figure drawing class when I was at Penn State and I wasn't sure when I went to college that I was going to be an art major uh, primarily the reason I ended up at that state school is because I had a full scholarship. I didn't pay anything. But the program itself was conceptually based. And I didn't, I didn't have any particular uh, genre in mind when I started within the art program. So my interest in representational art developed while I was there, not prior to, to arriving. But did you have a, an interest in conceptual art then, or modern art? I, I mean, yeah, what 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 I, made you decide to be an art major in the first place? Just the scholarship, or no, no, no. I had always I I knew I was an artist when I was five, and I was taking art classes, uh, private art lessons when I was six, five, six, seven years old, um, with a local artist painter in her studio. Um, I had I had done some some art classes at the Carnegie Museum of Art. In, in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh yeah. Pennsylvania, which is where I was born. Oh, okay. So I did that. That was a, that was one of those weekend programs that my mo- my mother used to take me to. It was in the museum, run by the the um, uh, by the university there, by Carnegie Mellon University. Mm-hmm. And I had done that for you know most of my most of my um, junior high school high school years. So I had always been interested in art, and I always knew I was I was going to pursue that. But like a lot of people in the United States, you become 
you know, you, you don't necessarily get encouraged to pursue that. At your time at Penn State, you were still doing conceptual work, or did you go into yeah? Well, work? Uh, so, okay. Uh, so back on back to what I was saying about the uh, about the nature of of art education in the United yeah. States uh, at at that time in particular, it was not something that was encouraged. My now my my parents always encouraged me to do pursue whatever I wanted, but when I went when I first went to the university, uh, I had sort of put that I that dream on hold the idea of pursuing uh, a career in in the arts, and I was a pre med major and lots of other things. Okay, and, uh, which in some ways I think is a very is is uh, is a good education because it gives you a well rounded view on the world and because I wasn't really paying anything I could stretch it out for quite a while but eventually I I my interest returned to to the, the visual arts and I uh, had never really done any sculpture up to that point um, but I took a sculpture class and and just loved the materiality of it uh, the tools and 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 I had always been been very handy so uh, so it took to it naturally, but the program itself was not figuratively based. And I didn't really know anything about art programs at that point in my life. I, because I didn't, I didn't do any research into it before I went to university. I just ended up there, changed my major, was an art major for a few years. And then over time became more and more interested in, in representation which was not something that people studied at that time. And this was, would be in the early 90s? Early 90s, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you pursue it then if you were in school? Did you have a figurative sculptor uh, on, on the faculty there? There was no one. No one doing representational work at all. Uh, it was, there were some old guard people that were from, you know, from the um, 50s and 60s who were uh, more interested in abstract expressionism and some people in minimalism. There, the chair of the sculpture department, who was a great, great guy, still friends with him, he was more interested in uh, process art mm -hmm. and art povera, and uh, but he was very encouraging. He never ever discouraged me from doing what I was interested in, uh, and I was a serious student, so I didn't, you know, took everything very seriously, whether it was conceptual or um, or if it was uh, formal, formally abstract, whatever it was. I, I would always investigate it with a with a level of seriousness that that assumed a point of view that that there was something to learn from all of that so once i started uh becoming interested in doing representational work uh nobody discouraged me and i've often heard from i hear this a lot from people my generation and even after who say who have these horror stories talk about how terrible their experience was sure, in sure. art school. And yeah, I know a dozen people. people. put them down, and I didn't have that at all. That's great. I didn't, yeah. I, now, having said that, I had no, there was no one that could really teach me the things <laughs> that I was interested in. <laughs> right, right, right. But at least they weren't working against your interests. No, nobody worked against me. Yeah. Nobody, okay. nobody, n nobody berated me for, for pursuing it. Eventually, once I decided that I wanted to pursue representation in my own work, um, I think they sort of thought the same way. That, well, it must be, there must be something in this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, well, I, I will say there's another aspect to that that I think is a little bit of a, a myth about, about the, the nature of education at that time, which was that anything that, that was representational was not taken, was not even looked at within the art world at all. Like there was, in other words, there was no example of representation whatsoever, you know, which, which, which isn't true. Um, and there are actually very famous examples, say Lucian Freud, mm -hmm. you know, who, was, uh, who, had, a, who had, a, had an enormous retrospective at the, at the Met in 1993 or four, I can't remember. So, so obviously people were paying attention uh, at the time, uh, one of the, my biggest influences was Antony Gormley, whose uh, his work has shifted o over the years, mm -hmm. not the same as it was back then. But his exploration of the body as a as a means of expressing some personal vision, and so I saw the I saw that there was a place for it, uh, even if it was a minority. 
I never felt that it wasn't completely impossible to do it. And we can talk. We can talk later about some contemporary artists that I that I like. But I. But I. Uh, getting back to that education track. These are these are artists who who I was introduced to when I was a student, and um, and I admired what I admire what they do, but I was not very good at doing that. <laughs> that was part of it, you know. When, the, when you admire, you talk about the contemporary or the nineteenth contem century contemporary artists. I'm oh, talking okay. about um, you know the, Martin Currier or. Right. Antony Gormley, you know, Anish Kapoor, who was, you know, more of a formalist back then. Uh, that, <laughs> I, that's a part of the story for me, is it wasn't simply that I became interested in representation. I found, I, I found it, that the language that they were using, I found it very difficult for myself. I, I, could, I understood it when I looked at it, but then when I tried to do it, <laughs> there was a disconnect. There was, there was a certain... There was a certain kind of literalness that I couldn't get away from. Right. And maybe if I had stuck with it, I would have been able to successfully find a uh, a material language for for doing something similar. But I decided I did some figure work on my own. I just decided, well, let me explore this, and I just became interested in it. So you went to Penn State. You right. were not discouraged from doing figurative art. You were allowed to do figurative art. How did you do figurative art? What uh, did you have any sort of outside mentorship or training, or did you make no, it up? I've never had one? a mentor or any. So here's yeah. the crazy. And so one of the advantages of going to a, a large university of uh, drunken college students, it's very easy to find cheap models. <laughs> <laughs> Go Penn State. Everybody needs beer money. <laughs> um, but that's 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 what I did. I right. I just hired. I would hire models, and I would I would I would, you know, I didn't know necessarily what I was doing. I didn't know any particular approaches to how to organize the information of a figure. Um, but I I would just hire models, and I would do it. I would save all of my money, and I would I was hiring models probably five days a week. Uh, for the last year and a half of college, fantastic. University. Well, and is is the technique you developed then uh, similar to the technique you use now? Because I got to say, you're you're probably most well known for your uh, incredible prowess in your technique. You know, you produce uh, startlingly, and uh, you know, one hesitates to use the word lifelike or realistic. You know, yeah. um, but you, I mean, your your technique is is impeccable. And so, so part of the answer to that is. At the same time that I was I was uh, uh, hiring models on my own, working from life a lot, mm -hmm. um, and um, and trying to figure out the tools and techniques because I didn't even know what a sculpture tool looked like actually, or a modeling tool looked like. I I would just make them. Mm -hmm. But what a way the what I did was it was a bit of reverse engineering. I would go to the library, the school library, and I would get out every book I could that had pictures of sculpture and look at. And especially this, the, 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 the work that showed some sort of aspect of the process. Um, and I would try to figure out what, you know, what kind of tools were they using. Um, any marks on the page that would give me an indication of how they constructed either a drawing uh, or marks on the clay that would tell me how they constructed oh, the sculpture. So, so a, a, like a great example of this is um, some of the... Um, the sketches, uh, the clay sketches of Michelangelo or Bernini, where you could see all the marks. Um, and and some of them, if you look really closely, you can see little tiny rake marks. Mm -hmm. And and so I and I knew I knew his technique of carving, as you can read about it. I knew he used his he loved the tooth chisel. And so I thought, oh, what he's doing is he's somehow imitating the carving technique in his modeling technique like there, there's a rake tool on the surface of the clay that he's using to find form so i just went <laughs> i went into the the metal shop of the of the school and i hammered out a tool and i had a forge and we heat, i heated up and made this little tool with there's like a little rake awesome did that made the exact same marks that i saw and i would just I, so i was reverse engineering what i could what i saw in the books and then hiring a lot of models and 
coupling those two things together. I didn't discover Lanteri until I moved to New York. I was going to ask, yeah, if you had gotten yeah. a hold of any of the, you know, like Malvina Hoffman's book or Sergeant Jagger yeah. or... No, I, I, did, oh. I had no idea that they existed. Wow. I, uh, I, I was completely clueless about that stuff, which huh. is... Which is, you know, as I look back, I think it probably would have saved me a year of work. If yeah, I but, you know, I think that. I think you'd be doing different work. Perhaps, I think yeah. you really would be doing different work. Probably. You're probably correct about that. Wow. Because there are certain things that I that I learned then that I still utilize today. Seeing, seeing just looking very, very closely at, at that work and um, reading every description I could about how they would, how they would conceptualize viewing. Um, that's how I did it. And then, and then, I, of course, I went to the New York Academy huh. after that. After and how, how different was that experience uh, now that you were in an, an actual figurative arts school teaching a, or learning a, um, a technique that had been different from the one you had developed? Yeah, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a good question because I think that's a, um, a key part of the story to, for me that, that year that I spent there. And that's, that was the only time I took a figure modeling class was that one year. And um, I don't really remember learning anything, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> in the modeling class. Right. Now, I did take an anatomy. I took an anatomy course. Uh -huh. And um, I took my first figure drawing courses there. There were a couple of classes that were really helpful to me. And the anatomy course was really very, very helpful. Only because... Now, I, I had known anatomy. I'd taken biology classes, so I knew basic anatomy. So coupled with my uh, doing a lot of observation, the anatomy courses that I, that I took there did make things click a little bit more for me. When I saw it, I thought, okay, now I understand a little bit more what I'm looking at. That was one semester. That was all I needed, really. Once I had that, I kind of understood what I was seeing. But I found it very frustrating, actually, going from... A contemporary art program to the New York Academy, particularly the New York Academy at that time. I was going to say that's probably a factor of the fact that it was still the early nineties, right? It was three ninety four. Yep, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And it was a very different. I mean, the the, the school has comp it's changed dramatically. That's what I hear dramatically. Yeah. And some people think it's changed for the worse. I think it's changed for the better. Well, they've they've included a, a more um, contemporary component. Is that yeah, right? Much more. Yeah, much yeah. more. And because back at that time. There was a lot of internal fighting about which particular theory of representation was going to be ascendant, which you know for somebody like me was not helpful at all to have people are fighting over over whether they were going to be Rubenese or Poussin. It's like I don't give a shit. Like I want to. I'm like trying to just learn some techniques, you know. Yeah. You know. I, I, yeah, but these, the techniques these... you learned there, they, they. I mean, you 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 say you don't remember learning anything, but you must. Uh, at least remember if the technique was, you know, very, very different from what you did or how it how it influenced or changed your Yeah, your in terms process. of the figure modeling. Yeah. You're right. Um, no, not particularly. Oh, wow. No, not particularly. Oh. There were no and it so was mostly you... just like uh, it was mostly just a class where you go in there's a model and you work from the lot from life. And um that was that's all that's all I remember. I don't have any there's no particular technique that I learned. Although there there now there were things that I that that I experienced there that really I in some ways were a distraction from what I had been doing. For example, there there was a there was an, a, a school of thinking at, at that time at the New York Academy that was very very sort of classical and where everything had to be had to be measured. There was a there and there was a not only measured, but there was a some sort of there was some sort of theoretical um, inter interconnection between that those measurements and an idea that would be that would be in the work. A canon of proportion. Right. For that's a good example. Right. A canon of proportion, for example, which you know, which neither interested me nor did it help me mm -hmm. because technic in terms of technique, because you know, to have somebody come up to your piece and say measure and say the scapula should be three quarters of a head tall. It's like, really? Who 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 told? Like, what God came down and made that rule? <laughs> you know, yeah. it just made yeah. no sense to me. Well, and it was and it was very frustrating. I, that's well, what, if it wasn't I, attached to an ideology, if it wasn't attached to uh, a, a meaning behind the measurement, then yeah, it it, does, it, it can't make sense. Right, precisely. Yeah. And I, and, and I was very, that was one of the reasons I left yeah. because I found that 
I found I was very discouraged by that experience and mm. and felt that I didn't I, I wasn't I, I really was having a hard time connecting the two interests that I had which mm-hmm. was which were you know, which were contemporary art and 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 contemporary intellectual thought and techniques that I wanted to, to employ to try to interdigitate those two two interests of mine and you know it, it again it was the, the there was this sense that that somehow we had to revive a particular period and yeah. and what seemed ridiculous to me was they were arguing over which period we should be reviving but you know the new york academy at that particular time was a battleground like a lot of other places in the 90s and that those battlegrounds were necessary probably to to distill down what we what we now have um but i i found it incredibly discouraging and frustrating and uh and i left after one year because i didn't feel like it was helping me in fact i think my work got worse after that year um and yet at the same time i wouldn't trade that experience because i've met most of my most of my best friends are people that i met at that time so so it was it was a really great time to be in new york and studying art meeting people who had similar interests but didn't know where to go we were all like a bunch right. of lost souls wandering around yeah. like trying to figure out you know, where do we learn this information and we ended up learning from each other yeah right yeah. so immediately leaving after um did you go through kind of what a lot of people do where you know you're, you're basically leaving an ideal uh, environment in which you can just sort mm-hmm. of focus on producing work and you don't have to worry about selling you don't have to worry about paying well, you might have to worry about paying rent, but you certainly at least have a studio and supplies and models yeah, right. uh, and instruction and crits. And... Yeah. What did you do? That's a great question. Right after. That's a really fantastic question because this is a, this is a major problem for most sculptors. Yeah. Right. Um, unless they have the fo- good fortune of um, having family support and money and whatever it might be. And, and those people are very lucky. But most of us don't have that. So I, you know, as soon as I left school, I became, I, I was discouraged for, for about a year. I was actually thinking of just quitting and doing something else. Uh, I just did, I was lost. I went back to Pittsburgh. Um, I, um, I started doing a little bit of teaching at uh, some art centers and did that for about a year and then got a call uh, because Audrey Flack needed, needed another assistant. Um, uh, David Simon and I, met her when we were both at the New York Academy of Art. We met a lot of interesting people at that time. And Audrey Flack had started doing sculpture right about then. Audrey and Flack being one of the original sort of photorealists. Photorealists, correct, yeah. correct. But uh, at that point, she had stopped doing paintings and was just doing sculpture. And she needed assistance. I, I met her when I was in New York. Dave also met her when, when he was in New York. He started working for her, and she was doing a large project, and she needed another assistant. So was this the project for Rock Hill, South Carolina? The big no. Huge this figures? is after that. Okay. Right after that. Oh. Uh, right after those those projects. Um, although they were being finished at that around that time. Right. But everything after that, I was an assistant on, hmm. um, up until recent work. I so I received this phone call. Uh, she needed another assistant uh, in Beacon, New York, which is where Talox Foundry was. Uh, they had large studio spaces for artists who were working on projects. And that's what I did. I just jumped in my car and went back to New York and started working as an assistant. And I did that for about six years exclusively. Really? Yeah. Six years? I didn't realize it was that it long. It was pretty long because I didn't, it wasn't just her. I, I worked on other projects. I, sure. Once I was there, it was, you know, that, the economy was booming in the 90s. So <laughs> there were so many big sculpture projects just money flowing in. Yeah, and you're at Talix and, Foundry, right. which was does it even exist anymore? Didn't yeah. it? Yeah, no. it shut down. Yeah, they shut down and were and were taken over by by Pollock. So they're now right. combined with Foundry Foundry across the river. But uh, at that time, it was the largest foundry. Yeah, there. yeah, it was like where you. Where I believe you... it was the largest foundry in the world. Really, actually. like bigger than Mariani and wow. enormous. Oh, that wow. place was enormous. Wow, I yeah. never had gone, but yeah, it was. But that what was great about it was was. There were artists coming through all the time, sure. and so I was. And they would set up. They would set up projects, and if they were in large projects, they would set up a space for an artist to work on it. And so it would be full service. They would do 
the enlargement, and then the artist could work on the project. The mold would be made right there, and cast everything. Um, and I, that's what I was doing. I was working for Audrey and you in were, the foundry, essentially. So, so Audrey Flack had her own studio there. Did you actually yeah. also have a, a workspace of your own? No, there? no, I just no, had no. In fact, I didn't do any of my own artwork for years. Oh, wow. I was so busy doing projects for other people. So in a way, that was part of my education. Uh, I was very good at adapting to the situation. Uh, and that might have come, again, from, that, from the way I learned to model was an I was con, I was just adapting yeah emulating techniques. I was emulating yeah, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was I was I was in fact I was I, I was critiqued for that when I was at Penn State that was one of the teachers said you know you're very good at you could copy any style but you haven't chosen one and of course I was you know, 19 so <laughs> right 20 right. years old yeah. but uh, but no I, I became very I became very facile at that skill when I was working for her um, but 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 the part of it, in terms of education, what I learned um, is there are things that you learn in that experience that you never learn in school, ever. For example, I once I started working for her full time, I became her represent representative at the foundry. I mean, she wasn't oh, cool. Yeah, so so anything that had to do with you know, the mold making, casting, um, I Dave and I would be would be put into the situation where we would have to negotiate those things with the foundry because we. If she wasn't there, we had to we had to make sure we oversaw the production end as well. Now David Simon was working for Audrey Flack as well. Yes, okay. yes. Off and on, I tended I stayed a little longer on a little longer as her assistant. Right. Uh, but he and I both worked on on that, and we got other projects, other thing, freelance projects together. Um, but that was that that's a very good experience because I uh, I had done one foundry course at at Penn State, which gave me the basic understanding of the technique right but no no none of the details of actual sculpture production which is slightly different so being around it all the time and seeing the business of the foundry the business of commissions the the ways in which artists interact was it was a great education a very valuable one too oh, incredibly valuable yeah. i mean something that i I draw upon now just as I'm um, just as much as the the technique of modeling, which I mostly gained from, from I just gleaned from other things that I could pick up. The the business end of it, the production end of it, I learned in those years. So it's so it's it's incredibly valuable. I mean, a lot of artists don't want to think about these things; they just want to do the creative thing in the studio. But sculptors can't do that. We don't have that luxury. We have to think about the production end of the process because I don't here's the other part of it is I do not believe and this goes back to, again to my con conceptual quote conceptual education Penn State I do not believe there's a separation between your ideas and the material that it's in I think those things need to be interdigitated all the time mm -hmm. you need to be constantly thinking about but but it's 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 materiality and and the forms you're using uh, as as one expression of an idea, and but of course the problem is for sculptors that we don't we don't get to do both of those things at once. That we're usually everything's usually s separated into pieces. So mm -hmm. you'll take a figure modeling class, and you're like, okay, now what do I do? You know, you right, know, right. You, you don't, don't you don't learn bronze casting generally, no. although there are more and more opportunities these days. Right. I think for figurative sculptors, but, you know, there's not a single. Uh, figurative sculpture program in the world that I know of that also teaches uh, marble carving no, no. They, uh, at any right, sort of so, high level. Right, so everything becomes separated. People yeah. kind of dream about what they might like to do. It's right. Like, well, this would be a great figure if it was only in marble. Right. Or, I know or, so many sculptors. I know so many sculptors who, whose favorite sculptor is Michelangelo. It's like, oh, really? Do you carve marble? Well, no. It doesn't make, like, well, right. yeah. That's essential to his idea. <laughs> I know, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's, what I, that's my point. You cannot yeah. separate those the 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 materials and techniques from from the forms yeah. that they represent yeah. they they're they're one and the same so ideally a student will get a chance to both um, get a handle on how to manipulate material to create form but also how to transform that into other materials so that they can find the right material for the kinds of work that they want to do yeah. and unfortunately they 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 think of them as two different languages, and I don't think they're two different languages. They're languages that work together. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's like it's like having a, 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 a an atelier or an art school who only teaches drawing, but calling right. themselves a painting school. Precisely. You know? Or they only or never like, getting into oil. Or they just do grisade. And right. Ex color. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It would make no sense to me. Uh, I've been saying for years that the the atelier or the the art school that will that is the first to incorporate all these you know all the major techniques. Yeah. yeah or even right. most of the major techniques. Right. You know. Right, bronze, I, I, marble. Well, they'll, right, they'll be the best art school in the world. Right, I I agree with that. Obviously, nobody's going to master all those techniques. No, one. but you should have the opportunity to learn it. Yeah, you should have. The, you should un exactly. You should have, you should at least understand the principles behind each of them, and explore it enough to realize whether or not it will be whether you can use those techniques for your work or not. For example, so this is and and talking about my work, it's a good example of that because I I was. Of course, when I was young, I loved the idea of carving marble. It was like the romantic idea of it was very attractive to me. Okay, but once I started making my own work and doing my own figures, I you know it didn't take me very long to realize, just based on my little bit of experience carving, that the figures that I was interested in creating were going to be much more suited to bronze than yeah. to marble. Yeah. Um. It's, and especially if you look at the current work that I'm doing. I would have to completely change the compositions. You They're have to, to put make... a hell of a lot of tree trunks. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> right. Precisely. There would be a lot of tree trunks going out the backs of legs. Yeah. yeah. Um, which would change the idea entirely. So the the knowledge that, in other words, I, the fact that I had, was fortunately introduced to some of those techniques um, uh, early on made it, made me very aware of what the limits and advantages of each were. Yeah. Because everything has a limit and everything has an advantage. Sure, sure. And and uh, this is backing up quite a bit, but back to the education at Penn State. One of the great things about the department at at Penn State when I was there, and I mentioned before that the, the chair of the department was he was his primary interest was was material culture and and, and process art. So he one of the advantages of that was he was very adamant about students exploring uh, materials and techniques. His theoretical starting point was the form is dependent on the material and technique that you choose. So that the form will emerge from, from your understanding, your deep understanding of these techniques. Um, now, of course, this is a theoretical point of view that's, that, has, that has nothing to do with figuration per se. However, because of that, we we had to, we had to learn methods of of mold making reproduction. Okay, we had to learn casting techniques, carving techniques. We learned we had wood shop. We had we had we did metal work, and it's all an introduction. I mean, mm -hmm. none of it was in in four in a in a college program or a university program. There's no way to become a master at any any one of those. Right. But right. But he 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 really made us think carefully about what those techniques could do for you in terms of the in terms of the language of the material and and its formal expression uh so so i, I think it, i think having I, I i agree with you i think if a school can just can could could get behind each of those techniques and give people a chance to explore them and then once they explore it they if they realize that that's the right lang that's the right material that's the right technique for what they are interested in exploring, and let them go deeper into it. I think it would be uh, uh, unparalleled education yeah, in the world. I did but too. but I don't. Unfortunately, it doesn't really exist yet. I'm no, trying. I'm trying. <laughs> but, but but yeah. Uh, here's frankly one of the problems. Sculpture departments tend to be well. They, this might be changing, but they tend to be kind of small comparatively. This is this is just an economic thing where you have you have if you have six students and you say I need a foundry I need a carving studio I need a metal studio I need three D did a printer I need you and instructors for, who are right, professional you instructors all, yes. for all the, right. you're talking about millions of dollars sure sure for sure just a few I mean people. there's a there's it's, a good reason this school doesn't exist this theoretical right. school I I think that's what it is I don't think yeah. it has to do with a um, any kind of resistance no no, no. I, I haven't experienced that at all I haven't talked to anyone in academia said that's a bad idea why would you want to do that everybody says oh that's a great idea now i don't who knows if that'll happen but getting back to what you were saying about about students not getting a chance to be introduced to carving when they are modeling is 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 a real problem because they may be doing things that in their modeling 
that trans that doesn't translate into carving the way they think it will absolutely or, or at all absolutely and that's yeah. why it's important that you get at least just a foundation so that you know even if for instance even if you mm. never ever carve your own work or cast in bronze your own right. work right. when you take your clay to the foundry you're going to be able to tell whether or that's, not they're doing a good job that's exactly yeah. right or or not only if they're doing a good job but what the possibilities are exactly. I mean, if, because if you don't, if you're not equipped to to uh, um, advocate for your own work, you're at an extreme disadvantage artistically, and um, that's where I think the education of, of being an assistant was great for me because I I was, I you know I was put in a situation where I had to fake it until I made it. You know, I was yeah, fake yeah. until you make it. That was yeah. exactly what happened. I was like, I kind of know what this is about. But you know, I'm I'm young, and I, and if I just assert myself and say, yeah, yeah, you should do it this way, you know, eventually somebody I'll learn something, and and that's what happened. I I was put in a situation where I had to learn really quickly um, that that end that production end, and it it it's not necessarily the order that I wanted to learn things in, but that's what happened, and it right. did benefit me later on. We'll hear more of my interview with Brian Booth Craig when the sculptor's funeral continues. So, what are you doing this summer? Going to the beach, or maybe to the mountains? Or maybe you haven't made your summer plans yet. Well, buddy, I sure have. I'm going to attend the premier event of the summer for figurative sculptors. I'm going to lead an elite cadre of students into the realm of Michelangelo, Bernini, and Rodin. That's right, I am going to carve marble. And you can too. Join me in the Wiltshire Workshop, a two-week adventure in the English countryside where both beginning and advanced sculptors will take the leap from being mere clay modelers who ship their work off to a foundry to have someone else do the real work to becoming a sculptor of marble in the tradition of all our favorite sculptors. They all knew how to carve, so why not you? The workshop is happening not far from Stonehenge, in the green countryside of Wiltshire, just outside of Marlborough where you'll learn everything you'll need to know in order to carve a figurative work in marble. In addition to learning the basics with hand tools and machine tools, you will learn the process of using a macaneta a punto, or pointing machine, the device which enables sculptors to make exact copies of plaster casts in marble. And that's just what you'll do. Choose from a selection of plaster casts taken from the work of master sculptors of the past, Bernini, Udon, Michelangelo, and more and create your very own true and faithful copy to keep. Not many people can claim to own their own mask of Bernini's St. Teresa or Michelangelo's dying captive in Carrara marble, and even fewer have made it themselves. But you can be one of them. And the workshop just isn't for sculptors with experience. Even complete beginners and non-sculptors can create a marble work of art in two weeks' time. We proved that last year. It can be done. And for those of you who have no experience in carving, well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's actually pretty simple. You just need the right tools and know how to use them. And that's what this workshop is designed to give you, the knowledge of carving and pointing. And after these two weeks, you will be fully equipped with the know-how to carry on carving independently in marble and stone. You'll be able to produce work that will stand out from all the other sculptors who limit themselves to bronze. And in a tight art market like ours, every bit counts. All the information for the Wiltshire Workshop, which starts August 8th, can be found at our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. There's space for just 12 people on this workshop, and the sign-up deadline is June 1st. But I have a feeling the course is going to fill up early this year based on the success of last year's course. So sign up today at thesculptorsfuneral.com or contact me directly for more details. The Wiltshire Workshop 2016. Become one of the few figurative marble sculptors out there and follow in the footsteps of the old masters. Check it all out at thesculptorsfuneral.com, and I'll see you in jolly old England. And now, back to my interview with Brian Booth Craig. Craig's solo exhibition, Internal Variations, Figures and Gestures, opens April 7th in New York at the Bernarducci Mizell Gallery. Up to this point, we've discussed the multifaceted aspect of Brian's education, and next, we'll hear about his professional work as a sculptor and how his concepts evolve. Yeah, from from there, I was ready to move on to, to other things, and and the opportunity to to teach at Lyme Academy right, right. came along, and then right. four years later, after that, I think you became chair, right? Yeah, four correct. or five years. Yeah. Four, right. 
think it was four years. Yeah. <laughs> think back, time flies by so fast. Yeah, it was four years after that, so I, I became chair. That's great. Um, and it's during this time that you started really getting into your own work. Correct. Finally yeah, getting, correct. you know, I, you know, I, I don't want you to, you know, break out your artist statement or anything, right. but sure, uh, sure. what, what is your work about? How do you describe it to people who haven't That's seen it? Good question. Um, anyone's work will evolve over time. So I prefer not to define what all of the work is about from the past to the to you know when I die right now because I think that's that's closing off doors um, but uh, but I can say a few things that that I think are general enough that will cover what I've done and what I may do in the future um, and that has to do with what what we were discussing earlier about the body as a language I'm really interested in the idea of the figure being the center of the cent not just not just a a conduit for intellectual experience but but integral to intellectual experience whatever the proprioceptive experiences we garner through touching things or moving through space are just as important as any kind of intellectual notion we have of ourselves so my when i started doing my own really my own work back in the in about uh, 13 years ago my primary exploration was uh, with self portraits and I and because I was thinking about the ways in which the body is uh, a sort of mythical notion that we have of ourselves in other words this whatever stories we may have that create the sense of the self within us are partly a, a fabrication because we're never we're never the same we're never we're not immutable beings that never change we we are are mutable and um and we are participants in that formation in that that actually modeling of ourselves right so it's a metaphor for um for the modeling was a metaphor for human experience so like you had mentioned that audrey fleck has a kind of a, an allegorical element to her work although sim you said also said symbol symbolist which I think is probably a little closer. I don't think of my work as having anything allegorical in it. Because the thing about allegory is that allegory touches the thing that it represents. Okay, so so if you have like uh, the allegory of justice, right? There's right. The figure of justice. Right. Like the idea of justice and the figure of justice are the same. They kind exactly of, right. Like they're it's, melded it's the, together. It's an embodiment. Yeah, exactly. They're right. an embodiment of an idea. But I don't, so I don't think of them as allegories because because I don't have that kind of specific specificity to 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 what the figures represent they're more it's maybe the maybe the better way, word is a metaphor yeah uh, okay no fair yeah. well metaphor i don't well can i sure, ask you about sure. an example a uh, specific example um oh i'm trying to remember the name uh the one with the side that begins right. with an m right well what's, i keep changing the name of it. oh do you <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem for me because i I, I a lot like Rodin. I I I am very comfortable with the idea of changing the titles. Okay. Um, right now, I it was I, what you're referring to is it was called memorandum. Memorandum. That's yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Now, what's that about? Now, because and this is why I use the word allegory, uh, because and and works like um, Executioner, which is right. one of my favorite pieces, where it's yeah. a, a for the folks at home, it's a it's a standing female, right. nude. In one hand, you know, with hands sort of both on her hips, uh, but very, you know, fairly subtly mm -hmm. holding in one hand a small bird. Yeah. And then the other hand a snake. Right. And so the idea, you know, it being called executioner, is that she's obviously, um, you know, going to sentence the bird to some sort of execution or maybe, via, yeah, yeah, perhaps. via the snake. Right. right. Well, that's, well, that's, yeah. that's what I get from it. Right. Right. But the thing is, why, why I see this work as uh, allegorical is that, that it's not a narrative. Uh, right, you know, this true. isn't this isn't a scene. This this right. isn't a real person about to you know standing around naked with a snake in her hand, right. wanting to kill a bird with it. Um, it is it is uh, symbolic, obviously. It's right. uh, it's allegorical. I don't know, it, and it certainly could be metaphorical right. for something. Sure. Yeah. But I she guess... she doesn't have a character. I mean, she doesn't have a. Um, there's no um, narrative content. Right. Exactly. Right. Precisely. I in fact I prefer the narr whatever narrative the narrative content is internal. It's something that's. That, that doesn't touch a narrative outside of the object itself. And, right. and that, which is usually what people mean by narrative content, because there, there, there are two different 
elements of narrative. There's the narrative that it refers to, and then there's the narrative of the of the art itself. In other words, so there's the material narrative. The way in which something is made mm -hmm. is its material narrative. They can go up and you can see it. You can see its the, the you can see the history of its making in the object. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that there's that element of narrative. For both of those things within my work, I cover my tracks a little bit. So I've, I've, I erase any specificity to either one of those narratives unless it makes the viewers, I'm trying to make the viewers search for them a little bit more. But mm -hmm. they're internal things. They're not, they're not referring to something outside of themselves, which is what you were saying. They're not, narr they're not narrative. She doesn't represent a character in a specific narrative. You say, oh, she is, you know, she is um, Venus. And this is the story of whatever it might be. Is the, well, yeah, the, but the, the idea of the, her birth is the story of her birth. You right. Know, okay. Aphrodite, yeah. you know, yeah. her birth. Um, so there's not she's not a character in that out in that all right she's but, a character she's, in but, my life what but not not in a literal sense no um i mean she's there, not literally standing there nude with a correct right. correct but there was somebody standing there nude that looked exactly like her well, yes <laughs> yes i presume so, that was the model right precisely <laughs> and so the so the symbols the symbols uh -huh. are in a sense private they're private they're symbols of of an idea that is a little bit ambiguous mm -hmm. and i prefer that ambiguity i think ambiguity is a is something that if if you don't have it in your work you should try to add it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> because absolutely. because it's not to me if you give the if you give everything to the viewer at the beginning um this is my problem with the allegory because al the problem with allegory is that it doesn't have ambiguity there's no ambiguity it's you know justice justice well right? it's so, no no i i i i the classical allegorical canon, yeah, you're absolutely right, right. where where it was designed as a, as a very uh, explicit language. Right, and, right, right. And, you know, right. you get a soccer conversazione and you put this saint and this saint right, exactly. and it represents this and that. Right, right. But um, that isn't the limit. That Those those are those are allegorical languages, but then, right. you know, there's, there's you know, anything could be allegorical when presented as such. And it's, sure, and it's, sure. You can form new languages, new words, new... Sure. New motifs. Sure. But I guess I, I I generally don't use the word allegory because I because people people think that if as soon as I say it's alleg if I say it's allegorical, yeah. they want to know what the meaning is. And I right. and you see what I'm saying? Oh yeah, that's, absolutely. That's my only that's my only problem. No, no, I think word. I think that's sound you know, it's and it, the greatest advances, you know, uh in sculpture have been made by artists who leave as much to the imagination of the viewer as they put into the work you precisely know, from donatello's saint george to rodin's walking man that's exactly right precisely i think there's there's an there's always an element of of um contradiction ambiguity imprecision and um um immutability within the idea of the yeah work. yeah and this leads the viewer to question why yes. and to look and, at the work more closely and allows the meaning to change yes because because meanings meanings are not fixed Meanings change. Right. Me, that, that's why titles for me are flexible. They don't right. really. They, and the reason titles change for me is because my own thoughts about them. These objects change. Yeah. So so they don't they don't necessarily require um, a a one to one relationship between what they are and what they represent. I prefer it to be something that people can read into. Um, there's there's a personal story behind everything mm -hmm. for me. They may be they may be thoughts about myself, or about the nature of experience and my re or my relationship to another human being. That's internal, and the and the, the the way the making of them is my is is my way of exploring it. It's my way of understanding that aspect mm -hmm. of experience. And, and so whatever comes out of that is an unpredetermined and somewhat ambiguous result of a very specific process right yeah. so so the idea is that although these are personal to you what the viewer gets out of it you're not necessarily and maybe even sort of like hedging you know have a bias against them actually figuring it out uh, explicitly yeah. why well, yeah i don't right i don't i don't i don't not against them figuring it out because i because i'm trying to figure it out myself <laughs> right right i think that there's there's always a we i, I never whenever i'm working I, I I don't have ideas and then and then say I need to make the sculpture of that idea. Meaning comes through making. When I make when I start in the studio, 
I'll get a model. I'll have a model next week in the studio and somebody I've never met before. She won't know what she's doing because she's never modeled for an artist. And I won't know what I'm going to make because I've never met her. And But I know I'm confident that something will come out of it. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of being open to what happens with that person in the studio, just seeing their body moving, you know, thinking about the language of, of a gesture or whatever it might be. Or whatever I'm, or, or it could be whatever I'm imbuing into the material exploration that's happening. So it could be my own experience that influences it. Um, this, is this, is why, this is why people psychoanalyze what I do a lot. Because sure, they, say, sure. They, they look at it and they say, well, that, for example, the one with the scythe. And what you can't see in that photograph is that I'm holding a pair of testicles. Now, that's an obvious reference to some, to some classical myth. However, I'm not trying to create a I'm not trying to create a representation of that classical myth. It was actually has has more had more to do with like my own psychological state at the time, right. which had to do you know, and that's why that symbol was interesting to me because it's it looks like I'm ready to execute myself because mm-hmm. the because the blade is right you got it around, neck, around the neck around my neck. It has nothing to do with this the the myth of Cronus and and uh, Aphrodite. I mean, you can read the people can read into it that, but that's not what's going. That's that's just a, that was just a starting point as I was playing with it. Oh, this is interesting. The way this this form meets this other form, and these this narrative, this personal narrative, somehow collides with this other narrative from the past. So it's, it it creates a lot of a lot of room for people to interpret and to in as I said to psychoanalyze. You know, my relationship with my father or my you know. Uh, or my own sense of mortality. That's perfectly fine with me. I'm not, I don't, I, I would neither prevent nor would I direct people to a specific meaning. Right, right. Um, so so it's, it's, it's interesting because basically you're, you're not, at the end of the day, you're not sculpting for an audience per se. Right. It's, it's more of a process you're working through and, you know, this is, this is the end result. This is the right. Exactly. The product of the process, and yet it's very attractive to people. And I think it's not only your uh, again your impeccable craftsmanship, but it's also uh, I think the fact that it, it it doesn't have a straight reading that yeah. things things can be viewed in, in in different ways. Yeah, and that's there's 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 room for that. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that that's a wrong interpretation. In in fact, I I think what you said about the process is a really important one to me and 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 the audience. Right, that there's no specific audience. Now, having said that, I could I could make things for an audience. It's not as if I wouldn't be open to that. If somebody, if I got a commission, I would adapt to that scenario, to that environment. So, so you you largely so, don't do commissions. I have a couple of commissions coming up, but they're commissions to do what I'm doing. <laughs> right. Okay. Right? In other words, the best kind of commission. Right. Exactly. There are people who who want me to sculpt them, and are going to pay me to sculpt them. But my condition was. That's fine, but I get to do what I, I... It has to fit within my process. You know, if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. I'll sell it through the gallery. But That's but, great. So are you going to get them into the studio just like you're getting your model in next model. week and sort of exactly. let, it, let it go from there? Exactly. Wow. It'll be exactly the same process. That's great. Because I, I, for me, what makes... If you don't love the process, you're in it for the wrong reason. If, you're, if you care more about the end result and the reaction because you are aiming for a specific target that you say this is what art should be and i'm going to make art that says this i think you know the process becomes a tedium and i i love the process i mean that, that's why i sculpt because it's a language that's natural to me it's a language that i feel comfortable with that i feel is a way of thinking through um, whatever i might be dealing with at the time it's a way of communicating what what I think the body can say to people. And so I love the process. I love just getting a model in and drawing or, or, or like with the self portraits, I'm, I was my own model. So I would just do drawings, just sketch, sketch out ideas. And when I hit on something, like, Oh, that's interesting. What's that all about? And then start making a little maquette. And then from there, make an enlarged version. And I think, I think that the, artist who has a specified end they say my work has to be only about this is cutting off lots of opportunities so obviously you have to have parameters to what you do i mean i'm working with the figure and Mm -hmm. i i have 
particular methods that I use, so forth. Um, like, for example, the, this series that I'm doing right now are female figures. I've sort of created some parameters in terms of scale because I want them to be cohesive. I right. want there to be an element of cohesion between them. So and this that, this is for your your first solo exhibition, or is it your I, first? No, it's no, my okay. first solo exhibition with this with this particular gallery in New with, York with my yeah. new um, new dealer. Um, and um, you can say their name. Go ahead, give yourself okay. a plug, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk some more about that. But right. um, the gallery is Bernarducci Mizell in New York City, uh, and so this is my first solo exhibition with them, and. Uh, I want there to be the cohesion to the objects. I don't want the I don't want them to seem like random displays of my my um, febrile expressions. You know that doesn't make sense. Right. But but having having said that, I don't you know for each particular object I don't have a preconceived notion. I didn't know before I started working with in the model of the studio. I didn't know that those objects would exist or they would. But I knew they would. I knew that they that there was a certain attitude that I wanted them to have. I was interested in the idea of the of female power and feminine feminine strength mm -hmm. and my own relationship to 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 the feminine as a as a man, particularly contemporary um, in the contemporary world, where where um, you know there there are a lot there are a lot of issues with a male artist using a female model. Uh, and I wanted to subvert that a little bit because, you know, I'm not interested in, in creating soft porn sculpture. You know, I'm not interested in recreating 19th century ideals of beauty or classical ideas of ideals of beauty. Like that, that doesn't, that doesn't interest me. I'm not interested in the, in the power relationship between the artist and the model that somehow mm -hmm. the artist is, you know, is the, the, the modeler of this, uh, this Pygmalion myth, right? Right, that right. Somehow somehow the 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 male gaze is 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 more important than the feminine presence i'm not interested in that at all in fact i find it kind of repulsive <laughs> i find it extremely repulsive um the you know that 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 women are somehow objects for our for our male for male pleasure that 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 i find extremely repulsive well, I've and, seen a lot of the works that you're going to be having in the in the exhibition, and they're all very, very strong. Some are even, you know, pretty aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's one, I don't know the, the name of it, and I, Maybe, I don't know I if you don't. Have, I might have not have a title for it yet. <laughs> uh, she's, she's kneeling. Uh, her mm -hmm. legs are spread apart. She's kneeling, and she's doing what I thought was a very Italian gesture. Right. Until I saw another photo of, of the same work, and she is actually holding something. A jawbone. And I was going to ask, is it a jawbone? It looked it like a jawbone. jawbone. Half of a jawbone. Is that is that like a Samson and Delilah sort of? Uh... It could be. I don't oh, know. Okay. It okay. could be. I didn't really. So I, I so the job actually, the jawbone was just a. Oh, it was it was ran it was not random, but it was um, it was a surprise. The the the, the pose actually came out of a couple of different poses with mm -hmm. this model. It's a very strong pose, and that's, that's very original. Yeah, that's the way she is. That's the way that particular model was. She's very, very confident. Um, and I didn't like that. That's another thing about the poses and the models. I don't have. I again, I don't direct them and say this is the pose I want you to take. I they come in. I just say just start. Moving around, just start doing something. See, you know, put, and I'll see something. Say, oh, stay like that. Move, maybe move your hand a little bit here. But um, it's more of like I'm reacting more to what I see. And then once I see a few things, then I'll put it together. Mm -hmm. But um, but that attitude is what I really liked. The the sort of strength and uh, angularity to it that yeah. that created this sort of tripod of strength. But then, but then the gesture. I liked the idea of the gesture, um, but I didn't know what was in her hand. I had no idea what it would be. Did you start with the actual gesture, gesture. And, and not even, uh, had you already decided you were going to put something in that hand? I hadn't totally decided that. Right. I just put the hand there and I figured it would come along. Something will happen. Right. Some, and that's exactly what happened. I was walking in the field behind my studio and I found this bone, which is a juvenile bone because the figure is half life size. Uh -huh. It's not life size. So the bone is not to scale, obviously. Oh, so did you cast I, directly I from the bone? I actually found an actual bone. Yeah, but did you cast it? Yeah, I did. Ah, okay. Did. So it's actually the it's cast of the bone. It's actually a cast of the bone that I found. And I didn't know what it was. I knew it had to be juvenile because it was small. But I knew it couldn't be, it couldn't be an adult 
job, adult animal jawbone because it would be way out of scale. Right. But I, what I actually liked about it was that I didn't a I don't know I didn't know what it was what kind of animal I don't know you what still it don't is. no I don't want to I don't want to know in a way huh. I don't know what kind of animal it is and I also like the fact that she's half scale and that is full scale whatever it may be right so they're not they're not from the same universe and yet she's holding it but I, yeah so it just made sense I put it in her hand and for the attitude that she was exhibiting mm-hmm. in her body language that particular object coincided perfectly. I just have this strange faith that that an idea will just come along as I as I'm open to it. Um, and and actually, all of those poses are the same thing. There's the one with the um, there's one where she's holding antlers in her hands. Yeah, and above her head. Yeah, you know, against her head. Same same thing. It was we she, the model and I were working through poses, and one day she wore high heels, so. I said, well, can you like pose in the high heels? He said, yeah, I can. I'll give it a try, which is not easy to do. She was mm-hmm. a real trooper. She yeah. really... Because um, it's a very sort of stretched out pose as well, right? With right, arms right. Over arms, up, arms up. And... Now, did you do two versions of that? Because I also know... Yeah, the... there's one where she's pantomiming. Pantomime, antlers, yeah. She's using her fingers then... as like antlers for right. her head. Right. I, I which... think it's it's such a beautiful design. It's so right. symmetrical, and I'm usually not a big fan of you know strict... Symmetry, symmetry, but yeah. man, it looks great. Thanks, I appreciate great. that. Yeah. Appreciate that. She has really long legs, or maybe you. Uh, well, right? she's on her toes too. Yeah, I know that, so, but, so but she, even she does have even long so, legs. Yeah, she looks like a the original model. So you yeah. really get the sense of like a like a some sort of deer. Yeah, the grace and elegance of some sort of like you know gazelle or something. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's, great. that's exactly what I was going for when I saw that. It wasn't, and again, that was not that was actually two different poses. The the yeah. the model took was standing on her toes and obviously you can't stand on your toes for very long right so you just so have the and then you, yeah correct yeah. but I um so that particular piece uh there were two different poses one had her arms above her head and I thought oh this these two things seem to go together so I put them together um and I really only worked with the model for like a day or two on that particular piece I made everything else up okay. um, once I knew the pose it was pretty easy um, but the other one with the antlers in her hands she um, she had the he- high heels on and. As we were mo- as I was working with her, I had this strange thought that the 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 heels, the shoes, looked like hooves, mm-hmm. and so I just happened to have an antler in my studio, and I said, "Let's play with this. Let's see what happens." It, there was something about the gesture and her and the way she looked that just made sense. Mm-hmm. And um, there's there's also a zigzag quality to the to the to the profile of her of the antlers in her arms, um, or the silhouette, I should say. And uh, that I think there's something I, I, I when I'm working, I like the f- the evocative qualities that come to me from the process. And I think if if some if it evokes something to me, then I have this sense that it will also evoke something to the viewer because I'm having the same experience mm-hmm. when I see the model do something and I say, OK, yeah, that that's that's powerful, which is what I'm going for. It's self-possessed, which is what I'm going for. It's both sexually aware, but not sexually available, which mm-hmm. is another quality hmm. that I was going for with those. So if it's evoking those things to me, even if I don't know specifically what this the, the meaning may be, I it's like a rabbit hole that I'm willing to go down. And I think if I'm willing to go down it, people might go with me. Brian Booth Craig, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having you into my studio. And, You're welcome. Uh, thank you for asking me. It's yeah. a pleasure for me as well. I want to thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to Brian for the interview. What you heard today was actually less than a third of what we recorded that day, but I imagine we'll be hearing more from the interview in the weeks to come. And you can see some of Brian's work at the Image Gallery for this episode, episode number 58, at thesculptorsfuneral.com. And don't forget, you can check out additional content at our YouTube channel for The Sculptor's Funeral and also on our Facebook group page. Join in the conversation on Facebook and do the whole online networking thing with like-minded sculptors and sculpture lovers from around the world. Ask a question, post current events, and get to know me and your fellow sculptors a little better. Don't forget, you can go to the website of the podcast where you can not only listen to the entire back catalog of the shows, 
but you can also visit the image galleries for this and other episodes. And while you're there at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can click on the Blick Art Supplies link, which takes you to the Blick Art Supplies website, where you can support the podcast simply by buying your supplies from Blick. It's that simple. And for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening. Have a productive week. Thank you.